You can turn with me now to Hebrews chapter 10. That's where we'll be for our message this morning, and we will continue in our one another passage passages of Scripture. We're going to talk about the forgiveness of God this morning. Let me try to change tones for a moment, and I think there's going to be a picture up on the screen. There it is. If you don't know who that is, that's my wife, Shannon, and that is obviously our wedding day, and um, I think she's gorgeous, um, and that picture sits on my desk in my office to see just about every day. I see it all the time, and I'm reminded of the girl that I married. You know what? There's, And I love looking at it. I love the reminder that it brings. I love the story that it tells for me, but here's the problem with that picture. That picture doesn't pray for me. That picture doesn't kiss me back. That picture doesn't tell me that it doesn't want anything in the drive-thru and then eat all my fries and then get shocked when I look at her and be like, cool it, right? It doesn't rebuke me when I do something stupid or encourage me when I feel depressed. It doesn't forgive me when I've done something that needs to be forgiven and I still don't deserve it. It's just a picture. It's just a representation of the real channel. And while I love it, it doesn't tell the whole story of who Shannon really is. It's one-dimensional. But Shannon has so many levels that make her so much more than that picture. There are so many things I love about Shannon that this picture can't give me. It can't give me her kindness. It can't give me her just sweet, gentle spirit. It can't give me her sense of humor. It can't give me her character. It can't grab my hand and squeeze it to tell me everything's going to be okay without saying one word like only she can when we're driving around and I'm obviously somewhere else. And she knows what's on my mind at that time. It's just a picture. It's just a shadow. Shannon is the substance. That's the shadow or the picture of the substance. So now, let's look at Hebrews 10. I know we were in a different part of Hebrews 10 a couple of weeks ago and now we're back. And if you get a chance to go and read the rest of the book of Hebrews, which I highly encourage you to do, Paul spends a lot of time talking about shadows. He shows us a lot of shadows, pictures of Christ from the Old Testament. So David was a shadow of Jesus. He pointed to a greater David. Abraham pointed to a greater prophet. Moses pointed to a greater deliverer. And the Exodus pointed to a greater deliverance, right? The deliverance from sin through the cross of Christ. Noah pointed to a greater deliverance through his flood. And we go on and on and on. And he keeps saying over and over and over again throughout this book, these are just pictures. The substance is Christ. Not one of these pictures captures the depth and the complexity and the magnificence of Jesus. These things are cool and they're great and they're nice and they're good reminders, but Jesus is better and Jesus is greater. Which means the writer of Hebrews thinks it's incredibly important that we don't miss this. He's basically saying, hey, if you miss everything else I'm saying, don't miss this. And he does it all over again in chapter 10. He points again to everything I've been talking about. It's just a shadow. And when you see repetition like that, it should make our ears perk up and look a little bit closer because repetition like this is used to emphasize something, to make a strong point about something. We shouldn't skip over it. So I'm going to work pretty quickly through the first 14 verses, and then I'm going to get to the climax of this passage in verses 15 through 18. But first, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Since the law... Sorry, I have my things backwards here, and it's kind of throwing me off. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. So the law, Old Testament, it's a shadow. It's a picture. And what is the law? Well, in its most basic, there's 613 of them. And yet, you could sum it up, you could sum up the law with the Ten Commandments, which are pretty simple to understand. Most people know at least several of them. Like on one level, the Ten Commandments are kind of just basic ethics, right? Like, don't murder people. Good, Good thing to live by, right? Nobody's going like, well, I don't know. I mean, there's a difference of opinion. We can agree to disagree on not murdering people. No, nobody thinks that. The Ten Commandments are pretty basic ethics. I don't know anyone who thinks you should be able to just go kill whoever gets in your way. 
except for maybe Vladimir Putin. People don't argue with the Ten Commandments. I don't know anyone who says, you should be able to steal whatever you find. If, if it's in front of you, just take it. If you find that guy, don't invite him to your house. Good principle to live by. So on the one hand, the Ten Commandments are basic morality, right? But then we get to Jesus, and he shows us that they are far deeper than we thought they were and nearly impossible to follow. And so this whole sacrificial system pops up in the Old Testament to help these people who are not, can't, can't follow and keep God's law. And what happens is you go to the temple, you confess your sins to the priest, he looks in God's law, goes, yep, you sinned, and then you have to offer a sacrifice. But it still doesn't work. People keep sinning, and they kept offering sacrifices again and again and again, year after year after year. That's what the writer is saying in verse 1. The old system didn't work long term. And what happened is that many, many people got stuck in this rut of religion, not because of what God put in place, but because of how they took advantage of what God had put in place. They thought they could live however they wanted. They didn't have to bother with daily obedience to God. So I'm going to go live like a demon all week long, and then I'll just go kill an animal at the end, and it's all going to be fine. And God's like, that was never the point. That was never the point. That's what we call dead religion. He said, yes, you're still going to sin, but I want you to strive. I want you to obey me. I want, your, I want to have your heart. I want to know that you want it at least to be a battle, not that you're automatically going to give in to sin and just slaughter some animal so that you can feel better about yourself. That was never the point. That's what we call dead religion. And dead religion couldn't free them from guilt. It couldn't take away their sin. They still felt shame and guilt and had to keep coming back over and over and year after year to try and deal with it. But doesn't that sound kind of familiar? Having to go back again and again and again, dealing with the same problem again and again and again. Look at verse 2. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered since the worshipers purified once and for all would no longer have any consciousness of sin? So it didn't work, is what he's saying. They kept coming to the temple. They kept confessing their sins. They kept offering up some sacrifices and coming back next week to start it all over again. It was a religious treadmill, and it sounds exhausting. You keep jumping on the treadmill. You keep thinking you're going to make progress, but when you hop off, you're right where you started. Because if there was progress, you wouldn't keep coming back. But there isn't any progress. You're stuck. So then verse 3. But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder. There is something that it points to. There is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So this constant going back and offering sacrifices was just this reminder that you were going nowhere. That, that's what dead religion does. It's constantly reminding us of our sins. You can never do enough. You're always running in place, and you're never making real progress. And the reason is because animal sacrifices don't ultimately take away sin once and for all. They can't. They were never meant to. In fact, they were meant to frustrate you on purpose. They were meant to frustrate you and make you long for something greater, something more than this. That's what the law was supposed to do. And that's what, Jesus pro or that's what God promised Adam and Eve way back in Genesis chapter 3. And that's what the law is still supposed to do today. What I mean is that it's not very difficult to make people realize that they're not good enough for heaven, right? It's not very difficult to help people understand like they're sinners. Most people get that. That's why many religious systems, dead ones, but religious systems nonetheless, have developed to try to help make us feel better about ourselves. Religious systems that are all about doing more and serving more, and helping others more, and giving away more money, and feeding more people, and digging more wells and in other countries, and saving the whales, and so on and so forth. All fine things to do. Wonderful things to do. But what's happening with that when we just do more, and more, and more, and more, and more? We're trying to make our lives feel like they're worth living. But here's a problem. And it's the same problem with all dead religious systems. They're going to do one of three things. They're either going to make you proud. Look at all the stuff I'm doing. I'm better than you, and I'm better than you, and I'm better than all those people. Or they'll make you despair. I'm never going to measure up anyway. There's no point in even trying. I might as well give up. Or 
they'll make you turn to Jesus. Look at verse 5 and 6. Therefore, as he was coming into the world, he said, you did not desire a sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Did you hear that? So they're saying, okay, God, you, you gave us this sacrificial system, but you don't want the sacrifices? And God's going, that's never what the system was about. I was never after, ultimately, the blood of bulls and goats. I was always after your heart. I was always after you, who you were. I'm never after all the outward signs, all the sacrifices. So if your animal sacrifice comes without any heart to go with it, without any obedience to go with it, I don't want it. Because I don't love your sacrifice. I love you. And since that never happened, he has to send Jesus. Can I just take a side note? It's amazing how we can still do this, isn't it? We go and we kneel however many times a day, or we pray so many times a day, or however many minutes a day, or we read so many verses of our Bible, or chapters of our Bible a day, or we go to church, or we serve the poor, or we feed the hungry, and we do all these things, and we think, God, is this enough? Is this going to do it? Is this going to make my good outweigh my bad? And God's like, what are you doing? This is why I sent Jesus. Yes, those things are all wonderful things to do. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do them. But if the reason we're doing them is to style, make God love us, and then we're out sinning and we're not giving him our heart, he's going, no, 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 no. I want your, I love you. I don't love prayer. I love you. I don't love your Bible reading. I love you. And when I love you and you realize that I love you and you realize this is how that you communicate with me and this is a way that you can showcase my love to others, well, then that's great when it comes from a place of you've already given God your heart. But if it sacrifices for sacrifice's sake, if it sacrifices of prayer and Bible reading and going to church and doing all of these good things, but it's somehow meant to make God love you more, he's going, that's not, you missed it. You've fallen right back into what these people fell into. So with the animal sacrifices, God never got their heart. And because that never happened, he sends Jesus. And we made, we made a mess of things. And so Jesus comes and he says, Father, let me solve it. Let's offer my body. Verses 7, look at verse 7. Then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, God. After he says above, you did not desire or delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. He said then, or he then says, see, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. So Jesus goes, all right, so the old system where you keep going, I blew it. I keep messing up. I keep coming to the temple. I keep confessing my sin. I keep confessing how messed up I am, walking away, trying to do better. It's not working. So put me in there, God, is what Jesus is saying, and let me get rid of the old order and start a new one. Look at verse 10. By this will, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Notice a couple of things. The remedy for our sin was God's idea, right? It was his will. We needed to be made holy. We needed to be sanctified. And he carries it out through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Then look at verse 11. Every priest stands. That's an important word, okay? Every priest stands day after day, ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. So here was the deal. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, priests always stood. There were no chairs in the temple. Okay, that's because a priest's work was never done. Okay, so if he he were to sit down, which he wouldn't have done, but if he were to sit down, that basically meant job's done. Nothing more to do. No more sacrifices to be made. To sit down meant you were finished. So he stood daily, all day, bringing sacrifice on top of sacrifice, on top of sacrifice. It was never finished. You know why? Because dead religious systems sacrifices can't get rid of shame and guilt and fear and emptiness that people came with. Look at verse 12. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Every priest stands, verse 11, day after day after day, making sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, verse 12. But this man one sacrifice, and then he sat down. 
Now we read that in initial reading in our, you know, 21st century minds, and we may not think that's a big deal. When they read this, they were like, oh, it's a big deal. Christ changed everything. His one sacrifice is good enough for all time. You know how much time is wrapped up in for all time? All of it. Past, present, future, all of it. Because those are all parts of all time. And then Jesus sits down, it's finished. No more work as high priest, it's over. Look at verse 13. He is now waiting until his enemies are his footstool. This is what God promised to Jesus. All right, you've done your job. Now I will make your enemies a footstool. I will put them under your dominion. Enemies like death and disease. Enemies like rebellion against the rule of God. John tells us that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, but there is coming a day when everything will be given over to Jesus. Then look at verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. There it is again. One offering, and it is perfected, and it perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. So when Jesus died then, how many of your sins were future when Jesus died 2,000 years ago? All of them, right? Yeah, all of them. If you're a Christian, you've been perfected already. Jesus did everything that was necessary. He perfected them. If you're a Christian, you've been perfected. And the great thing is though, because you're like, yeah, okay, but that, so he's done it all, but I, I still mess up. Like I know I still sin. I know I still do things that I shouldn't do. So what else is happening? Well, he accomplished it. It is done and it is being done. You have been perfected and you are being perfected. It is done and it's ongoing until the day that you stand before him in the flesh. So here's the deal then. Verses 1 through 14 are building up. And there's some great stuff in here. But they're building up to a climax, which is verses 15 through 18. Let's start with the first two, verses 15 and 16. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. For after, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days. The Lord says, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. In other words, I'm going to go from outside to inside. I'm going to go from working with my people outside to working inside. I'm moving this whole covenant from external regulations to internal motivations. I'm going to put things in your heart. So now it's not I have to, now it's I want to. Now you won't live under the weight of rules, but out of the freedom of a changed heart. Now I want to pause here to make sure we get something because this is massive. Apart from Christ's sacrifice, we were bound to keep getting on the treadmill of religion. It's what we do. We couldn't get our act together. We couldn't get our hearts engaged. We wanted to, but we couldn't. We kept saying things like, I don't want to do these things anymore. I want to serve God, but we're like Paul, right? The things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I keep doing. Why is this happening? But I can't seem to make it work. I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to walk away from my bad habits, but it's not working. I just keep repeating the same things over and over and over again. What is the problem? And the Spirit says, it's not a list of external rules. It's not about don't do this and do do this. It's not about how you dress or what you eat. It's not about observing certain days. It's not about how much money you give or don't give. Because if all those things come from the outside and don't originate from your heart to begin with, then they're worthless and it doesn't matter and you might as well not have done it. They get you nowhere. But then Christ dies. He rises from the grave. He ascends to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. But by doing all of that, he makes way for the Spirit to come in and change our hearts, to change even the things that we want to do. And you know what? Some people are going to take advantage of that. And that's just the truth. But I want to park here for a second. Some people are going to hear what I just said. And they're going to go, Oh, awesome. I love this church. I can do whatever I want. Jesus still forgives me. And they'll use it as a license to sin. And Paul talks about this. Now, should they do that? No. Paul says, should we use grace as a license or as an occasion for the flesh or to just keep sinning? God forbid. Absolutely not. But it does mean people will keep doing that. I wish they didn't, but they will. But here's something I have to come to terms with as a pastor and what we need to come to terms with as a church. 
if we're really preaching the grace of God the way the Bible teaches the grace of God, there's going to be people who take advantage of that grace. That is an indicator that we are preaching grace rightly. And that's a problem between them and God. Now, it doesn't mean we have to affirm that. It doesn't mean we have to encourage them to go on in their sin. That's not what I'm saying at all. But if we're preaching the grace of God right, there's going to be some people who are going to take advantage of it sometimes. See, I came to know the Lord in an environment that wants to police everyone's morality. Right? The church told people what they could and could not wear. What their schedule ought to be like during the week. The kind of music you could and could not listen to. Whether or not you could wear headphones or not wear headphones because then people wouldn't know what you were listening to. Places you could and could not go. These kinds of things were talked about often. And it, was, it, it made us think that this is the norm. This is what Christianity is. It, is. it is keeping this extremely long, seemingly constantly changing list of rules. Here's the problem with that, though. It's a preacher or a church stepping into the role of the Holy Spirit. But what Paul is saying and what we happen to believe as a church is that the Holy Spirit is way better at doing his job than we are. We are not the morality police. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to proclaim the grace and the truth of God. And sometimes people are going to presume upon that and take advantage of it. And the Bible says that people who really, though, understand the superabounding grace of God are not going to use it to run toward sin, but instead are going to use it to run toward Jesus. They won't become more sinful. They'll become more like Jesus. But we believe the Holy Spirit is more than capable of doing that work in people's hearts without our help. Now look at verse 17. And I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. Now where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Now this is where I want to spend the rest of our time because one of the greatest parts of the new covenant is what the Bible teaches about forgiveness. And first I want us to see the need for forgiveness. And here's the deal with forgiveness. It's only good news if you understand how desperately you need it. It means you're sinful. It means you're guilty of something, right? You don't need to be forgiven if you haven't done anything wrong. In fact, it's kind of offensive. Like, if I think I'm totally in the right, and you walk up to me and say, hey, bro, I want you to know I forgive you. I'm either thinking, okay, weirdo, or, well, I forgive you for thinking I needed to be forgiven for something because I didn't do anything wrong, right? Like, if I think I'm in the right, I'm not going to understand forgiveness. This is why the gospel is so, so offensive to some people. We're told we're inherently good. We're told that there's this great love inside all of us. We're fundamentally good people who should just follow our hearts. So when the Bible then comes along and says, no, actually, you're fundamentally all messed up inside. You're fundamentally a sinner. You're fundamentally flawed and rebellious against your maker. Well, that's offensive. And it's really a question of who you're going to believe. Are we going to believe the cultural narrative? Or are we going to believe the biblical narrative? And that's a choice we all have to make. And the difference between them couldn't be more stark. Secondly, I want us to see the work of forgiveness. Verse 15 says that the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. The new covenant is a work of the Spirit of God. And part of the new covenant is forgiveness, deep forgiveness. Our forgiveness is a deep work of the Spirit. Jesus didn't come, live a perfect life, die a horrific death, rise from the dead, and gloriously ascend to the Father so that he could simply dance around the edges of our life and peekaboo us sometimes and go, hey, just still here. Always here as a, as a spare tire in the back seat. Hope everything's going well. Hope you're making all the best decisions. That's not what happened. You think that's why he died on the cross? You think that's why he had a crown of thorns beaten into his skull? You think that's why he let people spit on him and mock him and punch him in the face? You think that's why he hung naked on a cross all day? You think that's why he stayed, sat in a grave in grave clothes in a borrowed tomb? You think that's why he rose from the dead? You think that's why he ascended to the Father? No! No! Not so he could dance around the edges of our lives, but he did it so that he, by the Spirit, could take up residence inside of us to do deep, very deep work in us, in our souls. Work that religion and irreligion and lists of do's and don'ts could never do. He came to deal with our sin, 
like our very nature, but also to deal with our sins as a whole. He came to dig down and root out the ways that you and I have screwed up our lives. And so you can rest now because I've done it for you. Quit trying, quit striving, quit working. I've done it. Now rest in me. That's the work of forgiveness. But then I want us to see the movement of forgiveness. Forgiveness always moves from the forgiver to the forgiven. It has to. So if the one offended, the one who's been offended, is not willing to forgive, no forgiveness is possible, right? But look at the willingness of God. I will remember their sins no more. See, God doesn't think to himself, I'll forgive them if they jump through these hoops. Doesn't do that. No, he takes the initiative and he says, he comes to us and says, Connor, I will forgive you. I will forgive you. See, we wouldn't have the courage to ask if we didn't know it was already available. And some of us, I think, I know, because I've talked to too many people here in Paris who think they're too far gone. They're too far beyond the grace of God. So some of you this morning might need to hear that. God didn't say, if X, then I will remember your sins no more. There might be somebody here this morning who needs to hear, listen, I've done it all. You are forgiven. There's nothing in your life I'm unaware of. There's no sin that's beyond my grace and my mercy. Jesus is saying, I died for that. Don't slap the hand away. I know you think whatever you've done might be too bad, but it's not. I, my grace, my sacrifice is sufficient. You are forgiven. Just come to me. Listen to how Jesus said it in John chapter 6, verse 37. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. God is moving toward people. God is moving people toward Christ. Here's what that means for you then, right now. You can be confident that if you feel you need to be forgiven, you can run to Jesus today, and he will not cast you out. He's not going to slam the door. You are loved and you are forgiven through the finished work of Christ. And if you feel the crushing weight of guilt or shame or sin, it's available to all who will come and receive it. And then I want us to see the, the impulse of forgiveness. Verse 17 again. I will never again remember their lawless acts. Listen, if God forgets our sin, then the impulse of every Christian ought to be toward forgiveness of others. When we recognize the height and the depth of our forgiveness, we will be willing to forgive one another. That's one of the things that God will put in our hearts and write on our minds, and that's a work of the Spirit. In fact, let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And don't grieve the Holy, the God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by Him. For the day of redemption, let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander be removed from you, along with all malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you. So what empowers us? What enables us? What encourages us to forgive one another? Remembering that God forgave us in Christ. This is what it means to be gospel-centered. It's possible by centering our minds and our hearts and our lives on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And did you catch what he said a failure to do this would be doing? Grieving God's Holy Spirit. So then to walk in the Spirit is to remain centered on the gospel and to be willing to forgive one another. So then what does that look like? First, it looks like forgiving even if the other person doesn't cooperate. Look, people have argued whether or not you can really fully forgive someone if they haven't even asked for your forgiveness. 
Uh, and I'm not philosophical enough to get into that argument and answer those kinds of questions, but at a minimum, what this does mean is that regardless of whether or not the person who's offended you asks for it, we can prepare our hearts in such a way that we know that if they ever did ask for it, we'd be ready for the answer. And it would be a resounding yes. That's why Jesus can say, love your enemies. Our enemies rarely cooperate with us. Or like, love our enemies. I have a hard time loving the person sitting three aisles back from me right now. I have a hard time loving the people who live under my same roof as me. But I think if we reorient our minds to the forgiveness we have received from God, it will change how we are able to forgive and love others. It's also the, this kind of impulse that led Stephen in the book of Acts when he's being stoned to death to cry out to God and say, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Were they looking for his forgiveness? No. But if they would have, it would have been readily available to them right then and there. It also looks like forgiving without trying to read the other person's heart. Here's what I mean. The Bible doesn't give me permission to be suspicious about the genuineness of someone else's repentance. Okay? So in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 22, Peter comes, right? Comes to Jesus. Hey, how many times am I supposed to forgive my enemies? And Jesus goes, mm, how about 490 times? It's just some huge, ridiculous number, right? Because that's not the way we act. He's seven times 70. That's 490, in case you were trying to do it on your calculator real quick. But Jesus says, how about 490 times? Even though you and I know after three or four times, we'd be going, do you even really want it? Like, are you even serious about this? But our forgiveness has to be radical. Why? Because God's forgiveness the fact that we keep messing up again and again and again, we keep doing the same stuff over and over again, and God still receives us into his family, that's radical. So who are we not to extend the radical grace and forgiveness of God toward others? Here's the last thing I want us to see then. I want us to see the finality of forgiveness. This is where it gets mind-blowing. <laughs> Let's look at verse 18 again. Now, where there is forgiveness of sin, there is no longer an offering for sin. So what offerings can you bring for your sin to make God appeased or happy or no longer angry? Nothing. Nothing. What about all the good things I've done that try to outweigh the bad things I've done? Nothing. There is no offering you can bring. So this week, you'll blow it. This week, you'll screw up. And maybe it's something that you know you've done before. And you've gone to God again, and you've tried to get victory over it, and you haven't. You'll screw up. It's not an excuse. It's just a fact. And something inside of you will go, how can I make up for this? And here's what some of us do. Offer God a week of not doing that thing that we keep doing. Well, I'll, I'll be really good about reading my Bible this week and being super disciplined the next few days to make up for this bad thing I did. God, I'll go to church this weekend if you'll forgive me. Maybe you're here this morning as a way to appease God. I'm glad, it, I'm glad it brought you here anyway, but hopefully you'll hear this and take it to heart. But God is saying, no, I'm not accepting any sacrifices anymore. Okay, but then what do we do? What do we do when we feel crushed by the weight of our sin this week? We run to God, who isn't surprised by our sin who isn't thinking, man, I had no idea I was dying for that kind of stuff. We run to the kindness of God. The God who isn't tapping his feet and crossing his arms. Again, really? And if you're a Christian, that kindness will lead you to repentance. Maybe some grief and tears at first, but ultimately joyful repentance. And when you know that, you'll run to him and not from him. And something else that's just been laying on my heart lately, and I didn't even have it to in here in my notes to talk about, but James, pardon me, James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. I read a book a few years ago by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor and seminary professor 
in Nazi Germany. And when Hitler took over, he decided that he was going to be part of the resistance to try to take down his regime. And yet one of the ways he was going to do that was by faithfully teaching the gospel to young men and women. And so one of the things, he wrote a book called Life Together. And the last chapter of that book was, uh, and ultimately he was killed. He was, he was beheaded by the Nazi regime. Uh, not beheaded, I'm sorry, but he, he was hung by the Nazi regime. And um, he wrote this book called Life Together, and the last chapter of it was all about this, this confessing our sins to one another. How do we live together? And he talked about the importance of this, about having a person, because sometimes what can happen is that we find it, why is it, and somebody challenged me with this recently, why is it that it's easier to confess a sin to God than it is to somebody with flesh and blood that's also a sinner just like you are? A holy God versus somebody with flesh and blood. He said, could it be that sometimes you're actually not actually confessing your sins to God? You're just saying them out loud when you're on your own to make your own conscience feel better about yourself. When you have to say something to somebody and look them in the eyes, and you have to be vulnerable, and they, that does something to the sin. Like Ephesians chapter 5 talks about, it shines a light on it. As this pastor friend of mine said, it breaks the back of the thing when you've got to confess it to another person. And what, other, what that other person can come and do for you, though, is they can come to the words of Scripture that says, hey, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. They can speak words of absolution over you, not because they can absolve your sins, but they can speak over the fact that Christ has absolved your sins. Here's the only way that's going to be possible in our church, though. Because what we have is we kind of have two extremes, right? On one extreme, you've got the people that kind of presume upon God's grace. And it's kind of like, I can go do whatever I want. And then you've got some churches out there that are like, yeah, and whatever. Come as you are and leave that way too. Because we want to say, yes, come as you are. But we pray by God's mercy and grace and Holy Spirit working within you that you won't leave that way, right? But there's some places that say, hey, come as you are and stay that way. Sin, what's that? Ah, we'll forget about it. It's not a big deal. Then you've got another extreme where somebody that's a Christian and goes to church with you comes forward with a sin and we go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that you could do something like that. That sounds like something out of, out of uh, the, the judges' days where people, I can't believe you would do a sin like that. And it's like, what do you mean? They're people. We sin. We all do it. It's all within all of us. But if we can have a mentality toward our brothers and sisters where it's okay to come forward with something because we know that we're not going to excuse their sin and they know you're not going to excuse their sin, but they also know you're not going to be there with a hammer to bash them for their sin either. You're there with the words of consolation and absolution and scripture and grace that say you are loved. And if you'll come, you're already forgiven. Christ is the reality you're longing for. Don't settle for the shadow. I'm going to pray for us. Before I do, I just want to read one more passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 7 and verse 44. It says this, Then Jesus turned to the woman and said, and then he turned, yes, then Jesus turned to the woman and then he said to Simon, who's a Pharisee there at the time, look at this woman kneeling here. And then he says to Simon, When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off my feet but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. I first, you, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, Simon, this woman's sins, they're forgiven, and they are many, but they've been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who's forgiven little, shows only little love. Or a person who only thinks they didn't have much to be forgiven for, they don't have a whole lot of forgiveness to offer to others. Let's pray.